Hey guys, Matt Chaos here. I wanted to talk this time about what I like to call the hard rules of D&D. And by the hard rules, I mean the rules that are frankly a uh, pain in the butt to use. These are the rules that if you're, you know, I'm watching players talk about the game and almost always these are things that come up as things they complain about because it's a lot of paperwork, it's tough to track, and because of that, people often don't even use them. They just don't implement them in the game. It's not even that they're necessarily optional, they just forget about it. Maybe even accidentally. And there's... Actually, there's a Mike Merles quote that reminds me of it. He he wants... And Mike Merles is the, uh, was one of the big you know top designers of D&D. For 5th edition, specifically. He said, D&D is 20 minutes of fun over 4 hours. Why did he say that? Because if you run D&D badly, it can basically just turn into doing your taxes for 4 hours. And then somewhere in there, while you're waiting bored, something fun happens maybe for like 20 minutes. So, a lot of the dungeon mastering is about figuring a way out. Uh, instead of making it 30 minutes of fun over 4 hours, we want it to be four hours of fun over four hours. You can't really guarantee that. There's always some give and take, but I don't think that it's a lost cause. So let's talk about these hard rules. The first one is, oh, the reason I'm talking about these actually before I get to those. I think these are actually good rules to use. I think they help the game and improve them. So the reason I'm going over these is that I think you should use them too. You don't have to and it, Honestly, it depends on the kind of game you're running. If you're running a certain kind of game, it'll help. If you're running a different kind of game, it won't. But you, it helps to know what this is good for, so that way you can make an educated decision about whether you should use these rules instead of just not using them because of laziness, and then you don't know what you're missing out on, or you don't know why. You know, sometimes when you take a rule out, you don't know what it's, you don't know what it's doing to hold up the rest of the system. It's like taking out the foundation of a building, and then things start to collapse and fall apart. So first, you should know what they are good for. And the first one is encumbrance. This, this is the one that almost everyone hates, like when you're reading about, you know, how to make the game faster. The first example they always bring up is how encumbrance is this tedious uh, bookkeeping. You're tracking how many things, you know, how many pounds things weigh and what containers they go into. Who really cares, right? Well. You're right if you're running, this is where it depends on the kind of game. If you're running like a streamed game or more of a narrative game, then yes, you don't really need to care about encumbrance or any of the other things I'm about to describe. Why? Well, if you're running a stream game, streamed D&D games are actually a lot different than normal D&D games. In a normal D&D game, you can pretty much let the players do whatever they want that they have fun doing. So if the players have fun shopping for eight hours, even though that's like boring as hell, I mean, I don't think that's boring, but putting that aside, uh, if the players love to shop for eight hours or they just want to poke at every little square foot of a room, then they can do that because that's what they have fun doing. But in a streamed game, you have to, the audience is like another player. They're going to get bored to tears and you care about keeping the audience there so you need to get rid of all of the slow boring stuff and make it get to the action and make it get to the the real meat of the game so you have to consider what's most entertaining so in these cases you actually wouldn't want to use encumbrance and some of the more bookkeeping stuff it's kind of like having a tool right like you have a screwdriver it's good for some things but you wouldn't use it to like as a fork to eat dinner that would be what this that would be like using it in a stream uh, you also wouldn't want to use it in a narrative game. And by narrative game, I mean, imagine a game that's mostly focused on role... Well, every game is focused on role playing. Oh, actually, let me take a step back. So, D&D is two different things put together. It's a role playing game. So, there's the role playing aspect, and then there's the game aspect. The role playing aspect is... All of the story, and the character interaction, and the personality, and the flavor. That's the role-playing aspect. The game aspect is the mechanics, the rules, the decision-making you have to make for risk-reward on how to like make the you know make the best turn in combat. 
So the more you lean in one direction, the less those other things are going to matter. So in a narrative game, they don't really care about, like, you know, whether you have 15 or 16 or 17 arrows. Who cares? But the, the whole point of a narrative game is, like, you know, your, your character's dad and how he's disappointed at you for wasting your life and not making anything of yourself and how your character reacts to it. All of, like, the interpersonal drama soap opera type stuff. So the further you go into the role-playing territory, the further you're going in that direction. And you could still have, you know, the best games, at least in my opinion, combine the both of them. But, uh, you know, like an extreme game or more of a narrative game where people don't really... Maybe you're all, like, into improv or, like, actors or something. Then you don't really care about, you know, the random... You know, does he do D6 damage or D8? Who cares? What difference does it make? It doesn't, it doesn't really... The important thing everyone's here for is this character's dramatic resolution to his story arc. You know, the... the Arcs, themes, plot points, motifs, more, you know, the moral of the story, that kind of stuff. So, encumbrance, you know, if you're doing narrative or uh, a stream type game, then you don't need encumbrance. But if you're doing a game that is focused on the game aspect, you know, the mechanical aspect, or it is even 50% using the game aspect, then this is what we're here for. Encumbrance. Normally in D&D, there's something called a dump stat. Uh, the dump stat is a stat when you're making your character that you could just ignore because it does basically nothing for your character. Like, imagine a, a wizard. They can pretty much always ignore strength because they're never going to use strength. You know, they're not going to go into melee with people. They're always going to be hanging in the back and attacking. So who cares about strength? They can just put... They can get like a three and just drop it in there. The problem with the dump stat is it's an automatic decision. So that that's a case of a bad game design. In other words, in any game you want every single decision that the player is faced with to have some sort of give and take, a pro and con. They need to be able to make a decision and weigh the factors and that's you know that that's what makes their choice meaningful. Like if you're going to go left or right and every sing left or right both take you to the same place, then why even have asked you? So in the same sense if you have a dump stat and you're always, the automatic answer is just put it into strength, then there was no reason to even ask you about it in the first place. Why is that even a choice? It's, your choice is meaningless because there was no real decision to be made. What encumbrance does is, because it's based on strength, encumbrance controls how much you can carry, suddenly strength matters now and it's not a dump stat anymore. Even the wizard who normally would never use strength, now strength matters because if they don't put it in there, they're going to be like a baby, basically. They're not going to be able to carry anything. None of the treasure they find, they're not going to be able to push someone out of the way. They're not going to be able to force a locked door open. They're not going to be able to, you know, carry their wounded friend out of combat. They basically became, uh, they basically become useless as far as any, like, physical activity goes. So now they have to actually consider, okay, maybe I should put something in strength after all. Suddenly strength matters. Um... Actually, there's other dump stats in 5th edition too, like, uh, intelligence is probably another dump stat. Like, if you're a fighter, you don't really need intelligence, so... I could do another video on looking how to make intelligence not be a dump stat. And in previous editions of D&D, charisma was always the dump stat, because... It didn't matter if your charisma was low, because you could just roleplay really well. Like, if you're talking to the king, and you have a charisma of 6, but you're talking very persuasively yourself, because you're roleplaying, right? Then it doesn't really matter if you had a 6. So, in that sense, you could easily just ignore Charisma and just make up for it with your own real-life persuasive skills. Uh, eventually, they kind of... that's become less of an issue because you have stuff like Persuasion Checks. Um, but it's still an issue. But in this case, Encumbrance helps you get rid of Strength as a dump stat. And not only that, it also makes the party roles a little different. Before High Strength characters, they're pretty much their only role was to just tank and... Attack. All they're gonna do is attack, right? Just attack this, attack that. When they have, when encumbrance is a factor, though, suddenly they can feel good about being the being the guy that carries everything. So, like, if you're a wizard, you might not be able to carry anything at all anymore. But now the party barbarian or the party fighter can be the mule. They can carry all your stuff. They now serve an extra function to help the team. So that gives them something else to do. In that sense, it also gives... There's a whole group of spells and abilities in the game that are meant to deal with problems like this. Like, if you ever looked at a spell or ability and you were like, Wow, this spell sucks. What's the point of this spell? Who would ever take this? I can't imagine 
a single scenario where this would be useful. Well, that's probably because you're not using the rules that make them useful. So, like, there's the spell Tensor's Floating Disc. That's an old school wizard, uh, wizard spell. What it does is it creates the wizard conjures this uh, three foot wide disc that can carry up to 500 pounds of stuff. Well, normally, if you're not tracking encumbrance, you would never take that. Why would you need that? But when you need to carry all your treasure that you found, let's say you found 500 pounds of gold in the dungeon. Well, you, if you're the wizard, you can't carry it. And maybe the barbarian's already carrying everything. You can conjure this tensor floating disc and help. So, there's all sorts of abilities. And this is true for all of the other things I'm going to... Uh, cover too. The uh, spells in our, there's a whole bunch of spells and abilities in the game that will help deal with them. And that's because in D&D, the way D&D progression works is at the lowest levels, you're just you're just buried in all these restrictions of things you can't do. And as you gain powers and level up, what that really means is those restrictions begin to fall away. Like let's say uh, wilderness. I could make a whole video on wilderness, but you know, normally you have to spend days going through the wilderness and navigate you might get lost and you have to worry about the weather and then there's like how many how much food and water do you have there's random encounters well later on you could just snap your fingers and teleport so that's not even an issue anymore and you that creates the sense of progression in players because now they feel better because they can see things that used to give them trouble and now it's no longer a big deal for encumbrance that's stuff like the bag of holding you know before you'd be counting all the pounds of everything now you have the bag of hold uh, holding, it's not a big deal anymore. Or, um, Leoman's tiny chest or something? Uh, there's a, there's a, there's a spell where you can, like, summon an extra dimensional chest and just shove all your stuff in there. It also adds a, uh, so yeah, so, that gives you a whole bunch of new spells or abilities that suddenly matter now. And it also adds a, I have a fourth point to this. It adds a new dimension to treasure because before you would just find treasure and the only thing you cared about is how much it's worth well when you care about how much it weighs suddenly the weight adds to the value like let's say you find 500 pounds of gold that's going to be very hard to take out of the dungeon even if you find a whole mountain of gold if you can't carry it out then you're kind of stuck you're it's useless to you it's like you didn't even find it but what if you find 500 gold worth of gems? The same amount of gold in value, but you could fit it in a pouch. Suddenly gems are like... Now there's a difference between having gems and gold. And same with something like uh, objects of art, which like, let's say you find a painting, a really rare painting. All it is is a painting, it just weighs as much as a normal painting w uh, would be, but maybe it's worth 5,000 gold. So it, suddenly all these different items that aren't just gold have a value and they are valuable now so that's encumbrance let's move on to spell casting components Spe uh, that's the second hard rule this is something that people always complain about you know i hate tracking hand movements and mouth movements the verbal somatic material components because you know i have to track what's in my hand or am i tied up or what, do I have the right materials? And it's a pain. So a lot of people recommend just hand waving it and saying you just cast whatever you want whenever you want. Well, that creates a few problems. And the whole reason... Actually, that's the way I used to do it. I used to use no components at all. And then I noticed players doing lots of video gamey stuff that breaks immersion and isn't realistic. And it doesn't really fit the versatility of the game. In other words, it, they're not acting like characters in a, in a virtual reality. You know, like another life. They're acting like video game uh, pieces. One of them is it stops you from spamming spells non-stop. Let me give you an example. The spell Guidance. This is one of the repeat offenders. I've seen so many games and I've run a lot of games where the players just spam Guidance on everything and it's just annoying because it doesn't fit the clerics. You know, you're getting a miracle from your god and you're just gonna spam it on, you know, trivialize. If you have actually respect for your god, you're not going to use it on just every little thing that ever comes up, you know, guidance here, guidance there, guidance, 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 guidance. You're not going to spe you're not going to use it to help you drink beer faster. But people do that anyway. It also kind of slows the game down cuz every single time anyone does anything, somebody rolls, "Oh, can I guidance it?" No. No, you can't. Stop. They already rolled. Stop asking. Well, instead of having to say that all the time when you have uh components you know, now they need to make hand gestures and voice gestures and incantations. Well, I know what you're asking. Well, how is that going to stop them? 
Well, that's where the role-playing aspect comes in. See, when you're doing those things, suddenly everyone else can see that you're doing it. And the thing is, nobody can, unless you're like a wizard also, and even if you are a wizard, it's not necessarily guaranteed, nobody knows what spell you're casting when you're making those motions. Like if you're in a, a market and you're talking to a merchant and you start making these gestures, for all they know, you're starting to cast fireball on them, or you're trying to do charm person to rob them. It's like so in, in like the D and D magic world, where anyone can be casting anything when they do these. It's like pulling a gun on someone. Like they have no idea what it could be. So you know, worst case scenario or best case scenario, everyone immediately freaks out because you might be doing something crazy. Worst case, they might attack you or try to stop you because they don't want to get blown up. So that. Cr that actually that creates a disincentive now your character will not want to cast guidance or charm person or all these other things in every single role playing scenario they're not going to try to every single time they talk to an npc they're not going to try to cast suggestion or charm person on them because they're going to see that happening as a result that forces them to use it when it's actually important or it makes sense in character so Enforcing the components makes people use the spells when they make sense. It's no, it's only when you stop enforcing components and just let them do whatever they want that it, it gets spammed. Uh, that's my main thing with it. Oh, the other thing is in, uh, the, the material components. A lot of them are rare and they're not something you just get on hand. So if you hand wave those, anyone, it's a balancing factor. Like there might be a really powerful spell and you're like, wow, anyone could just cast this over and over. Well, actually, no because you might need some rare component that you normally can't get or it costs a lot. So every time you would cast it, it inhibits you from casting it again. If you don't use those components though, then sure, yeah, they can do it. Uh, the other good thing is having those components creates quest hooks for the character. Like there's no quest or, or adventure goal that is as motivating for a player as something that they decide they want to do themselves. It's one thing to have an NPC just come in and say, Hey you, you're going to do this for me because I said so. Well, they're going to do it because that's the game, right? They came here to do a quest. But they're not going to be as enthusiastic about it as if they decided, Hey, I want to cast this uh, rare spell that I've been building up to. But to cast it, I need to go into this dungeon and find this rare angel feather or like phoenix feather or something. Hey guys, let's all go there. So all of a sudden the party starts developing its own goals and they start thinking of the game more seriously as a real place. They're, they start imagining it as what it would look like if they're actually there because they have to think about their hand motions and what physical actual objects they have. Oh, and speaking of it being, you know, in the same place, uh, the final thing that it helps in is, ironically, making it harder for them to cast spells makes it so it's less dangerous to be a wizard. See, let's say you're defeated by some orcs and you're captured. If they have no way to stop you from casting spells, if they're trying to like capture, you know, hold you as a hostage or take you prisoner, well, they can't really take you prisoner, can they? Because you're not, you don't need spell components, so you don't need hand gestures, you don't need anything. You just cast a spell. They can't stop you. The safest thing they can do is just kill you. You're dead. But if they can stop you from using those components, like let's say they put a gag in your mouth or they tie you up, suddenly there's this middle ground where you could be captured and. I mean, that makes sense too, honestly. Like, otherwise, no uh, wizard could ever be imprisoned at all, ever. Like, you put them in jail and they just misty step out. Well, not if their hands are tied or they have a gag on or something like that. That, that lets you kind of ground the setting more in some more logical scenarios. Like, if you think about it, when you take away these things, it ends up resulting in various fanciful situations that don't really make sense and don't feel right. So by having it, it improves the role playing and the, the seriousness of the world. Last thing, light and darkness. This one is the hardest one to track, especially in Roll20. Not so much offline, because you can just tell people you're, you know, you're in darkness. But you know, there's a whole category of spells and abilities like dark vision and devil sight and equipment like torches and candles and lamps that are centered around lighting. And it brings this whole logistic part of the game where players have to pay attention to what kind of equipment they have and plan ahead because if they run out of torches in the dungeon and they're screwed and in the, in the dark, everything can get the drop on them. See, most people don't realize this, but in the dark, actually in dim light, you take a minus five to passive perception and you make perception checks in dis uh, with a disadvantage. 
So in dim light, it, it's not just darkness where you're in trouble. In dim light, it has a penalty too. So you don't want to be in dim light either. Like I said before, there's a whole category of spells and abilities that get useful, right? Well, there's also, you know, a risk and reward that gets brought into it too. Let's say you're in a dungeon and you want to use your lights. Remember what I said about good uh, game design promoting tough choices where each option is good and you have to decide based on your priorities? Well, in a dungeon, you want to sneak around, but if you have a torch, everybody's going to know you're there. So you either light a torch, you know, you have a light and nobody can sneak up on you, or and then you give up on being able to sneak, or you turn off your lights and now you could sneak, but it's basically pitch black and anyone can get you. Because a lot of monsters have dark vision, remember that. They don't have a problem with the darkness. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Oh, the last thing, which is something I wanted to touch on, is darkness is, you know, lack of light is like the mage's kryptonite. Almost every D&D spell in the game, almost all of them, not all of them, but almost all of them, say you have to see your target to be able to cast. So the lack of light actually makes a big difference for your tactics. Suddenly, if it's dark and you can't see the enemy or, it's, you know, you're, you just don't have good lighting, suddenly half your spells don't work anymore. And it's things like the, the lighting and the encumbrance and the material components that keep mages under control. See, people always complain through D&D that wizards are out of control and they're like way above martial characters. And that's true for most of D&D and it's still a little bit true for 5th edition because they're so, they still have open-ended abilities, right? Like a fighter and a barbarian, all they can do is just hit things harder when they level up. They're still just hitting things. Nothing really changes about what they're doing. Whereas a magic user gets more and more uh, versatile options. You can fly, you can go invisible, you can attack a problem from a hundred ways. So people always complain about caster supremacy. Well, yes, of course they're going to be out of control when you don't use any of the rules, these rules that are meant to rein them in. It's like if you take a you know, an animal out of its natural habitat and then you put it into a new habitat and now it's like an uncontested predator, it could run wild. Well, that's because all the things that normally stopped it are gone. So, yes, it's kind of a pain, but unless you radically redesign the game, th these things still perform, this is why I think they're useful, they actually perform a very good feature. They, they help keep mages more grounded in reality of the game and make them more on even ground with everyone else. So yeah, that's my uh, video on using the hard rules. There's actually a whole bunch of other ones like wilderness survival type stuff, but I think I gave you a good argument for why these rules are actually good. And uh, you know, at some point I'll make more videos on other such rules. But for now, that's it. <laughs>